to you who answered the call of your country and served in its armed forces to bring about the total defeat of the enemy, I extend the heartfelt thanks of a grateful nation. As one of the nation's finest, you undertook the most severe task one can be called upon to perform. Because you demonstrated the fortitude, resourcefulness, and calm judgment necessary to carry out that task, we now look to you for leadership and example in further exalting our country in peace. We're here with Harold McGraw, who was in the Army Signal Corps in World War II. Please tell us your birth date. My birthday is September 24th, 1920. We are at their apartment in Florence, Kentucky. We are filming for the Barringer Crawford Museum and the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. Present are Tom Fricke, the interviewer, John Gross, and I am Ken Skelton, the camera operator, and Mrs. McGraw is here also. Go ahead with your questions, Tom. Thank you, Ken. Mr. McGraw, what were you doing before the war? Before the war? Yes. Well, I got out of high school, and uh, then I did various jobs. Worked for a, a, a dairy store, and I worked at a Hills grocery store, and then along came the war, and I went to started going to school. And uh, go ahead. How old were you when the war started? Uh, let's see, I was, it was in 1920. I was, must have been 20 years old. Okay. Yeah. And obviously, I mean, you remember December 7th? Oh, yes. What were you doing that day? Well, I was with Mary. We were riding around in a Model A Ford to listen to the news. <laughs> and when it came on the radio, you had a radio? Oh, yeah, we had a, we had a portable radio okay. in, in the Model A. Okay. And we heard that. Of course, everybody was shocked when it happened. Mm -hmm. Although we shouldn't have been, we heard knew what was happening in Germany, of course. Yeah. Right. So you were working at the time. At uh, yeah, but I can't remember exactly which okay. job I was working at at the time. Right. <laughs> That's, That's a long time right. ago. <laughs> so how soon after December seventh did you get get moving into? Well, the uh, after December seventh, it was uh, in forty two. I took a competitive exam. They were interviewing people in this area. They were trying to find people skilled in electronics uh, because they need, the Signal Corps needed electronic uh, people who understood electronics. I went to school and compared well, uh, com uh, compared well in a competitive exam. And I started the school and I joined the uh, Army Reserve. And I went to school for, you know, well, I guess I went to school from the 42 until uh, June of 43 when I went on active duty and I went through uh, several schools uh, including some uh, radar training mm -hmm. at that time and I went into radar after that. I became a radar technician. What, what schools and where were you? Well these were all service schools, Army, Army sponsored. They were in Air Avon, Kentucky. They had a big signal corps school down there. Nice. They, they, you, you remember that John or did you hear that? And uh, I was down there for quite a while, and, I, and also they had basic electronics and radio and, and radar down there. And I, I was at, lucky enough to get the radar end of it. And I trained on the SCR 268, and the SCR 270, and the SCR 271. And we operated those radars out of Avon, Kentucky, which is near Lexington. That's where that's located. And then I, and I was I got the call to active duty after that. And I went to Camp Crowder, Missouri for the basic training. And then I went to Camp Murphy, Florida, which was a radar uh, training school of the Signal Corps at that time. And I had this, I was trained on the SCR 582, which was an S-Ban radar. And it was for harbor surveillance and low-flying aircraft. And then I went to Fort Monroe, Virginia. And I was trained on the SCR 682 which was a, an improved version of the 582, and it was an S-band radar. And interesting enough, the SCR 582 and the 682 were built by the Crosley Corporation here in Cincinnati. 
which was just a coincidence as far as I was concerned, <laughs> but I thought it was interesting. Was that your choice to get into the Signal Corps? Oh yes, after I yes. went to radar, uh, electronic school, I was very anxious to get into radar, yeah. You, you mentioned you did well on a, a competitive exam. Yeah. Is that what you wanted to get into electronics? Yes. Okay, okay. that was your, your yeah, I, Yes, I decided it was a good thing to do and I liked it. So. You were in the service at this time? No, well, I was in the rate, I was in reserve until uh, June of 40, uh, 1943. Then I went on active duty and then I was in the service. Okay. Otherwise, I had a reserve. I went in reserve. I have a reserve uh, serial number. That's why I went on the reserve, yeah. So your training, you were in the reserves during most years? Yes, training. I was in the reserve, yeah. Oh, yeah. We were committed. We had been promised that when we first went into the schools that they needed uh, Sigma Corps officers really bad and we were supposed to get a commission when we got on. But mm -hmm. by the time we got on, they had so many Sigma Corps officers. <laughs> They didn't. They couldn't pro 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 give us a commission, so we didn't have a commission. <laughs> but anyway, we went to. I went to school, and then we went to Camp Murphy. We after we take, took the training on the 582, that we were signed uh, to teams, radar maintenance unit teams, and I was in the 416th Signal Radar Maintenance Unit. That's where I was with, and that unit consisted of one lieutenant. Uh, Lieutenant Christopher Wyatt, and I was the tech sergeant, technical sergeant, and then we had another uh, electronic person, a staff sergeant, and it was Andrew Carson, and we had a T4 who handled the power plant and the me mechanical end of it. It was a guy named Red Moore. These two fellows were from South Carolina, but that was a team we formed in, in Camp Murphy, Florida. And that's where we went through the war as a team all the way through there. So. The three of you? Yeah, all, well, it was four of us. Four of you. And Lieutenant Wyatt, interestingly enough, he was a brother of Jane Wyatt, hmm. who was on Father Knows Best on the television show. So I him. got to know her, uh, his mother and his sister, <laughs> and he just died, and he, uh, Chris died in the... Uh, uh, 2001, and I guess Jane Wyatt just died a couple of weeks or three weeks ago or a month ago, or something really? like that. Huh. And she was in her 90s. Yeah. Wow. I thought that was kind of interesting too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when you were in the reserves, you anticipated being into the art, being uh, what would you call it, enlisted? Well, in the, the regular army or. Well, I, I don't know. I never really anticipated anything. I knew I was going into war. Okay. Now, a lot of people went through that school, and I knew some fellows that did that with me, but they weren't as fortunate as I was. They didn't get assigned to a radar team and go ahead. Some of them wound up driving trucks and everything because the Army had, well, they just, they just had so many people, they didn't know how to assign them all. I, that's yeah. how I could, the way I could put it. What was life like here in the States during those years you were in training? Oh, in the States? Well, I thought life was pretty good. I didn't. Mm -hmm. I think we all struggled. Of course, we had the uh, ration coupons, and my family did, and <laughs> Mary's family, and all that. And we they had to get a certain sacrifice. But really, I thought that life was all right. We got along fine. You had a lot of contact with your family, and you, oh yes, yes. Were you married then? No, no, you I didn't wasn't get married. married. Okay, but uh, no, we we decided not to get married because I didn't wasn't sure I'd come back or not. <laughs> okay. okay. So when, uh, after your training, what year was that, 43? Uh, 40, well, yes, it was, 40, it was 43 when I went in, on active duty. It was June okay. of 43 when I went on active duty. And that's when I went to basic training in Camp Crowder, Missouri. Okay. Uh -huh. For how long? Well, it was only a month at that time because they were rushing people through basic yeah. training. And then I went to Camp Murphy. I'm trying to remember how long that was. That was probably uh, two or three months because I went to Fort Monroe and I was there up to through Christmas because we got orders to ship out overseas uh, in January, I think, that was in 44. And that's when we went to the West Coast and went overseas, uh, went to the South Pacific. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you were in that day again. Yeah. So in 44 you went to California? No, I went to, uh, actually went to uh, I think where we went, went out of, oh, we went out of uh, uh, Vancouver, Washington, okay. Washington State. Yeah. 
That's why we went. We didn't go to California. Okay. Went by ship to the South Pacific. Oh, oh yeah, went to ship. We got on the ship in uh, in California and went to, I mean, in Washington State, Vancouver, Barracks. Went down the Columbia River to the Pacific and then went down the coast to uh, San Pedro in California and outside of San Pedro. Never got off the ship just to refuel. And then we went, took a southern route and bared to the west. We were trying to avoid uh, Japanese submarines. And we went to Australia. That's where we went to Townsville, Australia. How long of a trip was that? A month. A month it took us a month to get over there. <laughs> How was the uh, troop ship? Well, uh, it was okay. It was very crowded, and uh, in the army at that time, they only served uh, two meals a day because that's all they could handle with that number of people on the board. And it was a Danish cargo ship we were on, and they they uh, they didn't speak too good English, but they apparently that ship had been caught over here when the war started, and we must. Have the government must have enlisted their services, and they used them to carry troops. And uh, but it was it was all right. Now they had uh, interesting thing happened on that ship. Uh, they had gun tubs and they had a navy armed guard on there, and for anti-aircraft and all that. But they couldn't communicate between the gun tubs because they had sound-powered phones, and they were all broken. <laughs> So three of us said, well, now, look, guys, if you let us eat in your mess three times a day, we'll fix your phones. So they did, and three of, we put, took them down in the engine room on the workbench. We repaired all our sound card phones, but it created a morale problem with the rest of the troops. <laughs> so they asked us to cease and desist. <laughs> so we reluctantly said, well, okay, we'll give it up. <laughs> but they, get their, they got their sound powered phones fixed anyway. <laughs> But that was an interesting thing. <laughs> that was a long trip, but it was interesting. Some of it's very good, you know. <laughs> Where'd you land in? Uh, uh, Townsville, Australia. Australia. Yeah, okay. Townsville, yeah. And how long were you there? Well, I was trying to remember that. Uh, not too long, uh, because um, I'd, say, I'd say probably a, a month or two, perhaps, something like that. So this brings us pretty much up to the spring of 44? Yeah, 44, and uh, at that time we went to New Guinea, up to New Guinea and went to Finchhofen. And we did some more, up, set up the radar up there, up on the mountain, and was uh, looking over for targets out north of there. And there was a Japanese uh, aircraft used to come over every night, or every day rather, and we called him Washing Machine Charlie because that's how he sounded. And so he, we, 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 no attacks there, though. We didn't have an attack. And we were sitting there until we decided the Philippines, the invasion of the Philippines came, then we had to go to the Philippines. Okay. Yeah. So what was it like in the radar? Can you just give us a description of the, the radar installation itself? And well, it was a 50-foot tower, and we had an antenna in a, in a radome that sat on top of the tower. And you could go up on the inside of the tower with a ladder to get into the radar because the receiver was up there and the antenna and the, old, and the sled, the slip rings down below, of course. But, and we had, a, we had a hut that you couldn't stand up in it, but you could sit down in it. It would fit on the back of a two and a half ton truck. That's where the operators sat in there and operated it. And uh, that's about it. It was, it was, tra it was a transportable uh, radar. Okay, it was mobile. Yeah. Mobile, yeah. yeah. And it, it was the tower too. Tower, yeah. We took it apart and, and put it back up. Yeah. Back up. Yeah. How often did, would you do that? How, how only when we reset it up and take it down. When we were operating, we wouldn't do it. But if we have to move, of course, you had to. Move. How often did you have to move? Oh well, that's so we well we moved from New Guinea to the Philippines. Okay. So. And uh, we went over to uh, the west side of the Philippines on Leyte Island, uh, to a place called uh, Bye Bye. And we went up from there towards Armok, and we set it up up there. And then the, the, after that, the second move of the Philippines came along, and it was going, we were going to Mendora the second time. Now, at that time, uh, let me digress here a minute, but we went to Fort Monroe, and, and we, we teamed up with some coast artillery people there. 
and the Coast Artillery guys would, was the operator operators of the radar. They did the operation. We did the maintenance. I did the maintenance in our group. So a part of them, at one lieutenant and a, and a platoon or a more of his people, went to Mendora on the second move, and I went along for the maintenance, and the rest of the guys stayed in, on Leyte. And we went up to Mendora, and we set the tower up up there, of course, and operated up there until... And then we set from there, we moved out to a little island called Apo Island. It's out in the Chi China Sea, and, and we tracked... Uh, anything like Japanese fleet and we got some accommodation for the Japanese fleet mm -hmm. coming down there we you know to put. So that's kinda of, that was the kind of duty it was. It wasn't front line or I didn't have to attack or have a bayonet charge or something like that. So you tracked aircraft and and the uh, ships. ships. Yeah. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. What would make you move the uh, what what would cause you to move the radar? Oh why? well only when the orders came through. Why, why were they? I don't know why. Yeah, okay. who, who can, I can't tell you that, Tom. I never did understand all the orders. Very <laughs> But they just decided, you know, they moved people around and asked us to where they need them, and that's what they did. So, yeah. Okay. Somebody bigger than me had to play that. <laughs> MacArthur on down. <laughs> how, how many people made up a crew versus, I mean, talking about the operators and the maintenance uh, well, people? Well, I'm trying to remember how many in Coast Star artillery guys we had operating that set, but they did it in shifts because we were operating at 24 hours a day, and we shut down one hour for maintenance. I was always involved in that, but uh, the operation went on all the time, and of course they were in contact with the, and reporting information all along, so. You won our maintenance, that was daily? One daily, hour? oh yeah, we had an hour yeah. maintenance daily, yeah. What'd you have to do? What well, we just had to check it out, tune it up, make sure it's working normally and everything, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have a lot of uh, action on your, were there, you mentioned the one, uh, the well, we, washing machine, Charlie? Oh yeah, well, oh yeah. Yes, when we first got to the Philippines, uh, we got in there on a Sunday afternoon on a Liberty ship, we were on a Liberty ship, and they, they had invaded, and I guess we came in right behind them. And uh, we got, we was in Leyte, in Leyte Gulf, and, uh, out, and the clouds were billowy white, and it was a blue sky, and out of the cloud came a Zero, and 38 on his tail, and he was firing, and I I got under a winch on the deck because who knows where those bullets were going to land. <laughs> and he comes down, and it's, and uh, this plane, he, he, Jap cut, cuts out. He was trying to get away from the 38. He cuts across, and we had a, a Liberty ship had a five-inch gun on the fantail on the last hull, and I was in the fourth deck place, and the fantail had a five-incher. They fired at him, but he was so low, the, Shell went through the guy's wing, and he, he just went right behind the plane, the ship behind him, and into the drink. So I, that was a little out of the accident. I got, I said, like, well, that was pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> close as you wanted to get. Yeah. yeah. But that's kind of stuff that happened. Yeah. Of course, I was on some ships where, when uh, we had a lot of attacks uh, on, the, on the ships, and, and there's a lot of ACAC in the sky, but fortunately, we didn't get hit. Now, and the me next move in the Philippines, was from Leyte to Mendora. And we went south of, of Leyte, the, the ships, there was 25 ship convoy, and we went around the end of Leyte, and we cut over and got into the China Sea and started up, and, and the Japanese had sent 25 planes for 25 ships because they were going to stop us, and they were all kamikazes. Mm -hmm. So what, the one that hit our ship hit just the deck and the wing clipped the ship and he had metal and oil all over the deck. But that was that was the most, uh, I guess, closest we, I came to really having a big problem because the ship behind us, the one being on the side of us, and the one in front of us, they were all hit dead center and they were burning and a lot of people in the water. It, it was it was really chaos for a sure. while there. Yeah. So that battle, call it that, was a kamikaze? Yeah, that was a kamikaze. They sent those people out to stop right. at the convoy because they were trying to stop us, the Japs were. And how many ships were hit out of the 25? 20, well, I don't know how many. I, I know four of them because I could see them yeah. burning, but how many I didn't have a count on those. But I'm sure they hit more ships because they, uh, they, they were really interested in wiping us out. Sure. 
And then after we got to Lay Day, it was on Christmas Eve, uh, they came over, they bombed us, uh, it was just over Christmas, so while the PA was playing White Christmas and Bing Crosby was singing, we were getting bombed with phosphorus bombs <laughs> and they, all these phosphorus things hitting and you couldn't, you couldn't put them out any way but smother them with dirt. You couldn't put them out with air because if you're in the air they just keep burning. So that was a little interesting too. Where was this at? When in Mendora. Mendora. Yeah, okay, before we went up the coast and set up the radar. We just got there when this happened, yeah. This was Christmas of 44? Yeah. 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 Okay. It was Christmas of 47. So How about Christmas of 44? What? You mentioned a little bit about it. Well, that, that's about that's all your, I can tell you. That's the most memorable. It was, it was just another day. <laughs> okay. Okay. Were you concerned ever of uh, your being a radar installation, of being radar installation, of being targeted? As oh, a, sure. If they'd have found us. Now, yeah. once we got up to on the door up in the mountains mm -hmm. set up, we were north of the city, I guess 10 or 15 miles on the mountain, and we used to set track planes going into San Pedro, which was where we came from. The Japs come in there and attack that. We would we could tr track them, but they didn't know we were there because we were in a coconut grove, mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, uh, camouflage. If they did, I'm sure they would have sure. wiped to come after us, yeah. But your tire was pretty conspicuous, I would think. Well, it was green. It was okay. camouflage, and it yeah. kind of blended in, so. How tall? It was 50 feet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Could you talk a little bit about the camaraderie, your, your oh, crewmates yeah. and your... Oh yeah, the camaraderie was great. I, I made a lot of friends and knew a lot of people over there. And lost track of them now, but yeah. Chris Wyatt, who was a, a lieutenant, uh, I guess just about uh, five years ago, I started looking for him up, trying to find him, and uh, mm -hmm. if he was still alive, and the, the, the Covington Library helped me do that. They. I didn't have a computer then, and the, but they did, and they found the, him in a phone book mm -hmm. in Geneva, Illinois. And wow. So I got in touch with him, and so we communicated with a computer and email. Sure. I, in fact, I think I still got an email of his daughter sent me when he died. Oh. Uh, so, uh, yeah. so yeah, we had a lot. We had and, a lot, and then we went to uh, after after the war. Mary and I went to. We got married, but we went to Clemson University. And the Carsons, the Carsons were down there, Randy Carson and his wife. But we lost track of them since then. The years have gone by too fast, and you're getting different things and sure. things. Just I like to maintain contact, but I, we didn't. But we had a lot of good friends in there. So mm -hmm. yeah. supporting each other, I'm sure, during the oh yeah, whatever, oh yeah, whatever it took whatever. Uh, every, it yes, that's right. Yeah. What was life like? I mean, as far as your Living conditions, food, well, I think, uh, just well, I every think day. You try to make it as good as you can, depending on where you are, but uh, we mostly live in in tents over there that most of the time. And it was all right because it would, I, I'd like to prefer it because I like the hot weather and I could handle that. I could, probably couldn't have handled Europe after yeah, <laughs> all that cold weather. Especially December. But we lived in, yeah, right. It would, but we lived in tents and uh, we even we even uh, made a prefab to floor to go in a tent, mm -hmm. and then, and then uh, late day when we came back from Mendora, I came back after the war, war moved on north, and uh, moved, went back to Bye Bye, and it was real good over there. We had a lot of things. We had uh, uh, we prefab the floor to put in the tent, and, and in fact, Lieutenant Wyatt and I shared a tent at, at that play at that time, and. Uh, and I think we try. Everybody tried to get by as good as well as they could. And some people uh, really did well. Some of the guys went to the quartermaster court, and they'd come out with a lot of things like ice cream mix yeah. and things like that. <laughs> but that was only when the war had passed us by. You yeah, know, we, okay. we were. That's when you were trying to live like a person again. <laughs> what did you do for recreation during those? Well, there was, during the well we played ball and we played uh, volleyball and uh, all sorts of things and. Uh, one of the guys that uh, was an ambulance driver for the uh, 79th Station Hospital in, on the, in Dulog Lady, that's where I, well, by the way, I had hepatitis when I was over there. And uh, I was in the hospital and I ran into Bobby Hartloff. And he's a fellow that's from around here. Now, whether he's still living or not, I don't know. But he had an outrigger canoe, and when he shipped out, he had to go, they had to, they shipped that out someplace. 
he gave me his outrigger, so I enjoyed that. <laughs> me and some of the other fellows <laughs> used to go out and paddle around the ships. <laughs> Where was this? In, on Leyte, Leyte, after I came okay. back. Yeah, that's after the war moved okay. up. You know, yeah. we weren't in the, we weren't fighting then. We were waiting to go to Japan. That's what we were doing. Tell you the truth. <laughs> so when the Philippines, when the Americans came back onto the Philippines, invaded the Philippines in '44. Yeah, you were. They invaded, and then you set your. Well, we yeah, they invaded, and then right after that, we put we came to Lady ourselves on the Liberty ship, and that's why I described about this fight of this dog fight, that, and uh, but we didn't get we didn't disembark for a long time. It seemed like it must have been uh, almost a month on that ship until they could get everything squared away on the islands, because right. that was a really a big effort over there yes. at that time. It took them a while. And then you set your uh, radar installation up? Yeah, well, we did that after we moved over to Bye Bye, yeah. Okay. That's when we did that, yeah. Now, Bye Bye was across the, the island from where we went into Lady. We went on, around Dulog. And that was south of Tacloban, which was the main city there. Now, over on Dulog, uh, uh, Dulog there was, there was a mountain that you had to go across, and the roads were bad, but we had to go across there, and we did. And that's where we set up. We moved over. That's where they that ordered us to go. So that's the way we went. So, yeah. It kind of sounds like you were following the invasion. Oh yeah, from the Philippines. Oh absolutely. Yeah. Is. yeah, we were right there, and yes, we were, we were doing that, follow and following up other oper major operations. Right. In fact, when we were in the Le in Leyte, that's when the Japanese decided they were going to get rid of the Americans on the Philippines. They didn't want the Americans there. And they set up a pincer movement of their navy. They came, down, they came down from the north, and then they came through the islands from both north and west and the south. And they had a pincer movement. They were going to cut off Lady and the supply line. And I'm sure if they had been successful, I probably wouldn't be here because they were they would have annihilated everybody in the Lady Gulf. And I was on that Liberty ship then, so that was that was a pretty tough time. And that's when a lot of well, it was a major engagement at that time. Uh, destroyers and all the battleships were over there, fighting and the air, and the aircraft carriers. So it was it was a major yeah. engagement. Uh, it's, yes. After the Philippines, you went. Well, that's where I, I came home after okay. that because the war ended. Gotcha. It, we were set to go. We were getting ready to go to Japan because that's where I thought we were, they were going to invade. Until we dropped the atomic bombs and uh, then they had surrendered. So. We get to we got in line to come home. What was that like? The time between thinking you were going to Japan, were you? Well, I was anxious. There wasn't any. No, there wasn't any. I don't think it was any problem. We were just, just accepted it. We had to, had to do what you have to do. So, uh, but after that, when the war ended, it, then it got a little antsy because everybody was anxious to get out, get sure. back home. But yeah. then you couldn't find a ship to get on, so, <laughs> so you many. had to sit there. <laughs> But we did. That was what happened, and it, it was pretty nice. So, all in all, I, I didn't find the war that objectionable. It was dangerous at times, but we had a lot of good friends and a lot of people was in the same boat, and everybody was working together. When they dropped the bomb, where were you then? Well, I was in the Philippines, okay. but I, I didn't hear about it for a couple of days. But then we heard about it, and, <laughs> and they, when they hit Nagasaki and Hiroshima. <laughs> What were your thoughts then? I thought, boy, maybe that we will get to go home. Yeah, so that was... <laughs> yeah. So I got home nearly just a little before Christmas uh, in 45. I got to San Francisco. So. A lot of celebration. Oh, yeah. The, well, uh, when I came in, you know, that, 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 a lot of that was over, I guess. Of course, the guys on the ship were all celebrating. They, they wanted to get home, too, you know. But everybody took it in stride. It, it wasn't anything outrageous or anything. What did you do between the end of the war and December? Just was it just kind of a uh, well? It was just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we they, we moved over back over on the other side of Leyte and was just sort of waiting to get shipped back home, get a ship yeah. home. You didn't do any more radar. No, work we no no. Radar work everything got closed down yeah. after that. We didn't do any more of that. So. For that so. Yeah. So you're just basically waiting to get just waiting down. to just staging staging it, trying to get the right in line to get a ship to get yeah. back. Yeah, all happy that the war ended. <laughs> you got back to you said you San Francisco. Is that where you landed? Yeah, we landed in San Francisco. Okay. Yeah. When when was that? This it was Christmas uh, about Christmas uh, Eve before uh, okay. 
but not 45. And from San Francisco, you went back here to Kentucky? Yeah, yeah went back to took Kentucky. a train and back train. to Fort Knox and got discharged and okay. uh, then came home. So <laughs> discharged in 46, I take it then? And, well, yeah, it was in January, January 46. 46. Yeah. Okay. And then what happened? You were home and... Well, <laughs> I'm trying to remember what happened. We got married in, uh, in October okay. of 46. And I started college. I went to I went to UC and I went to Clemson, South Carolina. But uh, I don't know what we did in between. I can't remember. <laughs> Forget some of this stuff, Tom. <laughs> Too long ago. I heard you were in the Music Bowl this year. <laughs> <laughs> Clemson and Kentucky played in the football game. I know, year. I know, <laughs> I know. Great game. Yeah, I know. But, so did you get a degree from Clemson? No. You just, no, okay. This, I was just down there for a while. And we had our first child when we were down there. Okay. So. And then you came back, when did you come back to Northern Kentucky? I guess we came back, uh, I think it was the summer of, uh, I'm trying to remember the date. I guess it was the summer of 46, sometime okay. there, yeah, yeah. yeah. And got a job and... Yeah, I went to work uh, for uh, Crosley at Avco over there. Oh, okay. And, I, and I, worked, I worked there for a long time. In the electronics field, obviously. Yeah, well, yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I worked in, that's what I've been, I was an engineer over there okay. for a long time. Okay. Worked on television, and then I worked on the government contracts, and we had some big radar programs over there okay. and after that. Yeah. So the training was definitely oh, beneficial Oh, definitely to you. good, Got definitely you. good. Yeah, yeah. I really, I really yeah. like that. Still do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you mentioned you have been talking about your keeping contact with some of your... Uh... Yeah, well, I haven't been. I guess I'm out of touch with most everybody now because I was so busy when I was working. I used to yeah. have a big group and I, had, I was a manager and I, it was just so many things going on I kind of lost track of everybody. <laughs> you know how life is. You yeah, get involved sure. in things. You just have to keep going. I did do a lot of traveling though. We uh, traveled all over the country and uh, worked for different, for different companies, Lockheed and uh, Okay. Yeah, I went to all at West, and we went to England and worked for Marconi, and, was, and so you know we just we had a good life. In fact, I took Mary, Mary and I went to England, and then we came back and went to San Francisco, back out to the West Coast, down to Sunnyvale, and yeah. in L.A. and down to San Diego. We were all up and down the coast, so we did a lot of things. We had a good life, really, yeah. really happy with it. You ever go to any reunions? Do they have reunions? Or? Yeah, well, they have. They used to have, and they still have some meetings, but I haven't been to one lately. We kind of aren't able to do that. But mm -hmm. We have a the group of the engineers that formed a group out of, uh, uh, it used to be AFCO, and uh, somebody brought that out. See, that's all changed like every other company. Yeah. They sell out to a group of hold -up, so uh, owner, other owners that like to get into the thing. And so things change. And, but we do have a group that we, I still belong to, and it has most of the guys that worked there for a long time. And we see each other and talk to each other once in a while. Have we heard all your experiences? What are your thoughts on war? Oh, I don't know. Let me think about that. Uh, I, I don't think war is very good, but I think it's terrible what we have going on right now. But I, I think what we're doing is, is the best thing we can do at the moment with Iraq, but that's my thoughts on it. Yeah. Okay. I sure wouldn't want my kids over there if I could help it. But <laughs> John or Ken, do you have any questions? That... Yes. Um, I wanted you to talk about the natives you mentioned that were in oh, New Guinea in that New you Guinea. saw. Well. <laughs> We had a lot of natives in New Guinea, and they are really primitive. They they uh, had bones in their nose, and they have fuzzy wuzzy hair. We used to make jokes about them when they came in the camp. Uh, they walked through there, but uh, we'd see a lot of them. And we walked. We we take a hike. We I used to hike out over there quite a bit, and through the woods or through the jungle, you come into a clearing. Here's a bunch of the natives sitting around chewing betel nut. Their teeth were all red because beetle nuts are narcotic, see. <laughs> and they were just like just like the Americans on drugs. I mean, this is crazy, but that's the way it was. But I knew people in there, and I knew them in Australia, and I knew them in the Philippines. So we knew a lot of. I got to know a lot of people over there.
what did you eat at your bases? Was it K rations or? Well, no. Let's see. I'll let me recall that just a minute. Uh, in Australia, we had mostly bully beef. They call it bully beef. It was corned beef. Australia had raised a lot of beef, and they were selling a lot of beef to the army. That's what we were getting to eat. And we got up to uh, New Guinea. We had some bully, mostly switched over to spam. Because <laughs> the army bought an awful lot of spam. <laughs> But uh, we had some guys that were cooking, and they cook, they were in our unit, and they we, they set up a mess, and some they did pretty good, really. I wasn't too fussy about it. I ate most anything. <laughs> you said there was a lot of real hot, humid weather. I guess did they have oh, yeah, rainy it was pretty season? Hot. Yeah, it was pretty hot weather. It was it was tropics. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. But it was nice over there. I, I enjoyed the tropics. So I, it was my kind of weather. I could handle that really well. How high were the mountains on those islands? Oh, uh, I'd say they were probably not any higher than some of the hills here. They weren't like snow-capped or anything, but they were they were fairly high. I don't know how many feet it was, but uh, they were pretty high. Yeah. Have you gotten back there? Since oh, no. Never no, did you I, haven't been, no I haven't been back over there. It would have been nice to do, but I hadn't had an opportunity to do that. <laughs> When the bomb was dropped, was there any thoughts or anticipation from anybody amongst the ranks anywhere that that might be used as a strategy or a I don't think that, so, that you John. ever thought of? There's Not a... to my knowledge, because the time we heard it, we didn't hear it like that. We just heard that they had dropped a, an atomic bomb. Of course, nobody knew what an atomic bomb mm -hmm. was and, or realized the devastation it could cause. See? So, no, I didn't hear any of that. Most people just sort of... We accepted it, and we'll see what kind of see what happens next. Uh, yeah. Do you have anything else that you want to add that we haven't covered? That you stories or anything that you? Well, we covered a lot, but well, let me see. I, I'll tell you one interesting thing. This doesn't do anything to do with the war, but on Mendora, we were about ten or fifteen miles north of San Jose, and we were short out in the boonies and. Of course, we were camouflaged with the radar, and we could track and hear the planes down in San Jose when they go in to flight the jets. But periodically, someone had to go to down to San Jose to take the mail and get the different supplies or whatever. So at one one of those trips, I I, I was the guy that went, and uh, and you have to walk because there was no roads. It was all it was all hiking, and uh, as you go along the coast where the streams would uh, drain into the ocean. It was swampy area, and it was mud, it was black mud, and it was quite deep. You couldn't begin to walk through it. So how did you get around that? You'd either have to take a boat and get it out in the ocean. But what we did, they had water buffaloes over there called carabao. They're huge animals, and they use them, to domesticate them. They use them like other animals in this country. And so we had some Filipino kids would go along with these carabaos. We'd get on the carabao and ride it through these muds because they could go lunging through that soft mud like a tank. <laughs> but if you fell off, you'd probably never get up. But I did that. I, that, I found that to be very interesting that one time. And when I, of course, we had to stay overnight in San Jose and stayed with some Filipino people down there who invited us to do that and slept on the floor with pillows. But it was kind of, it was kind of interesting. All these things, all this was an experience. All, all the good stuff was an experience when you get separated from the dangerous part. Yeah. So anyway, that, that's kind of interesting. I thought that sure. was interesting. Yeah. I never did that again either. <laughs> <laughs> did most of your mail come by ship? Uh, well, I assume like I assume it did, Ken. I don't know. It was just an APO number. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't know how it got there. I, I don't know if they flew much of it over. Or you had to keep it uh, as light as possible. Mm -hmm. I knew that. But, uh, and of course all the mail we generated had to be censored. So Mary would get letters with holes cut in them. <laughs> well, um, could you tell from the date on when the letter was written 
as to how, how long, long it took, took to get you I probably to, could but I don't remember yeah, it, I'm sure month. it took a while oh it took yeah. a long time I'm sure I'm sure it did yeah well we certainly want to thank you Mr. McGraw well for listen your story you. and for well, your well I thank service. you guys for so, listening <laughs> no it's our it's our pleasure, pleasure. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you very much yes. well I thank you appreciate it I hope I've helped you something. I, oh, before you came, I kept thinking, well, what are you going to do with this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Ken told me. Yes. Yeah. Every, every story is fascinating in its it own is. way. It yeah. really is. We well, learn sure, something about I'm history. Sure there's a lot of other things I can think of if I started sitting down to think yeah. about it. Because mm -hmm. I was there a long time and yeah. went through a lot of things. So, yeah. Do you have any scrapbook pitch? pictures? Oh no, I tell you, before we came over here I had a lot of mementos and things, but we moved out and I had to clean out the house and this place is so little, <laughs> I don't have much left. Yeah. I did write up something, I'll give you a copy of it. Okay. I wrote That'd up something for my kids, they were, they were bugging me recently about, why don't you write some of this down, because mm -hmm. we, we never heard it. So I, 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 I'll send that to the Library of Congress, so okay. you know, right. we've got a manuscript from that other okay. veteran. What a wonderful project it is, the Library of Congress, the Veterans oh, yeah. Center, I mean, to do this, to it is. preserve these literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of stories. Yeah, well, I think it is wonderful yeah, that they're really doing is. that. Yeah, yeah, I think. really do. Yeah, and then your kids, too. And oh, sure. And get you a copy sure. of this. Oh, yeah. You know, get copies yeah, well, I appreciate getting a copy of yeah. what you what you all doing here. And I'm sure your kids will enjoy that, oh, too. Oh, I'm sure they will. Because yeah. it is a, yeah. a living legacy. I wrote him a letter every day he was over there. Yes, she did. She wrote a letter every, every day. day. She wrote one every day I was over there. No, I'm not sure I got them all. But yeah. I think did you get them in like bunch and bunches? Like you get 10 or 20 at a time? Yeah. 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 No, I wish we would have time for that. <laughs> Marvel and a hobbit head. But shall we tell him what I sent you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> every day, huh? Every day. Every day. What'd you send? Wow. A letter. Well, no. I. I don't know how come he to do it. That was a long time ago. But I sent him a one my night one my one my nylon. She sent she sent me two of her nylons, but one of them didn't make it. I only got one. So the guys really gave me a hard time about that. <laughs> Talk about I gotta go find a good one legged gook. <laughs> <laughs> Not easy. <laughs> Not easy. <laughs> and, and I got that when I was in the hospital with hepatitis. I had hepatitis in, in the late day, and I wound up in a 76 station hospital, which was a group out of Pennsylvania. And, but I had hepatitis, and I don't know where I got it. it was, all they called it was infectious hepatitis. So I don't know what kind of hepatitis it was. But fortunately, I recovered from that. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> I had my star flag in the window. Uh, you were in my home mm -hmm. every day, huh? Oh so, yeah. Uh, and I'm I sure you saved every letter, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I, yeah. I wish I could have, but no, yeah, I don't. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, what was that like when you when you got to meet? Where did you meet? Was it when you came back home? Where did you Anywhere first? The office. My oh, I don't think it was there. Was it? I don't know where we met. You, you got off the train in New Well, you live right. She lived almost across the street from me. So. Oh, is that right? <laughs> but, honey, you got off the train in Newport. And you okay. came to, I worked at a finance company in Newport, fin fin family finance. Make mm -hmm. loans. Mm -hmm. And he got off the train. I was just two blocks from the train. And he walked over to the my office when he came home. And I was Really I bet. So you didn't know he was coming home that day, huh? No. Yeah, I surprised <laughs> you. I bet you were well, surprised. Anyway, it was an experience. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure, sure these guys coming home from Iraq are going through yes. all kinds of things. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry for yeah. that. Yeah, it's horrible what's going on. Yes, it is horrible. They have to and it's a darn shame that uh, we couldn't uh, have had a better approach than yes. what we did over there. Yeah. yeah. But again, that was. I want to thank you very much. Well, you're quite welcome, Tom. Welcome very, to interesting. Yeah. very interesting. Very interesting. We've been doing. Ken's been doing a bunch of these. John and I have, and we just hooked up with Ken a couple of weeks ago. And, well, uh, good. These together. March, I didn't right. see any of them. No, they were, I think a lot of them I think, shipped I out think of Dr. Powlite was in yes, that the large yes, yeah. yes, he was. He was in that. No, I didn't see yeah. any of those. Yeah, he uh, actually, Dr. Powlite was my eye doctor. And was he? We uh, just had our World War II exhibit at uh, Behringer, which I wish we'd have got you earlier. 
You should have come up there. It, would have been, it was we just closed it down two weeks ago. Well, I was there. I saw. Oh, were you there? I, I was over there. We okay. came over one day and looked at saw that. All right. My great, daughter great, took good. me over and Mary yeah. and we went in and looked, walked all through it. So yeah. we got a chance to see that. Good. Yeah, we had Dr. Pilate's, uh, his uniform. Yes, I believe right. you did. Yeah. I saw that over yeah, there. Yeah, and I had so. great opportunity. Well, I, Dr. Pilate Jr. was also uh, my doctor, my eye doctor after Dr. Pilate Sr. kind of somewhat retired. Uh -huh. We went over to his house and brought the stuff. I was one of, me and another guy went and brought some of his, picked up the stuff, the uniform and some of his medals and brought them up. And that was just a neat experience, too. Just, yeah. You know, <laughs> well, you know, well, I told you, when we moved over here, I just cleaned out everything and, was, and yeah. told the kids to take what they wanted yeah. and dispersed it. And I know my, my son got all my combat ribbons. I Good. gave all those to him. Good. <laughs> At so, least somebody's got that stuff. Oh, I, yeah, I yeah. thought we'll keep it in the family. Yeah, <laughs> well, for sure. That's, that's historical. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, it's passed down. So. Yeah. All righty. <laughs>